Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and welcome to episode seven of 24 and 24 Concertos from the Inside. Today, we're focusing on the Brahms Concerto. And I know I always say that every concerto is my favorite, and therefore no concerto is my favorite, and I love them all, and I love variety, and how can I pick between them? So at one point, I came up with a very morbid way of saying which concerto is my favorite. I said, okay, if I knew I was about to die in one hour, and I could only play one last concerto, which would it be? And with that in mind, there was no, um, no question I would pick the Brahms. The Brahms Concerto is often described as being um, inf influenced or inspired by the Beethoven Concerto, and that's actually missing a step. In fact, Joachim's second concerto, his great masterpiece, was influenced by Beethoven, and then Brahms's concerto was inspired by Joachim's. I discussed this whole history of Joachim's concerto and its relationship to the Brahms in my album, The Brahms and Joachim Violin Concertos. Um, I think up on the um, ourconcerts.live website for you right now, if you go to the, um, the, the sidebar on the right and you click on the info tab right above where the chat is, um, you can read my program notes just about the Brahms. But if you go to Sadie Records' website and search for that album, you can actually click and read a PDF of the entire CD booklet and read the whole essay about both concertos. It's fascinating to read about the relationship between Brahms and his best friend, Joseph Joachim, his longtime collaborator. When they first started hanging out as young men, Joachim was slightly older and definitely far more experienced, especially at orchestration. And it's fascinating to read their correspondence, and we have a great deal of it that's left to us, um, thankfully. And so we can hear them discussing it back and forth. And the manuscript score, if you guys could pop that up on the screen, um, happily, they used a whole bunch of different colored pens and pencils. Red pen, red pencil, blue pencil, gray pencil, black pen, you know, all so that as it was going back and forth and they were adding different ideas on top of ideas on top of ideas, you could see where it was at by which color of pen or pencil was being used. So you can track the whole evolution and it's absolutely fascinating to see things being scribbled out and even in a way more interesting than, or interesting in a different way than Beethoven's manuscript, which was just himself deciding he didn't like an idea and scribbling it out and trying something else and angsting about it. But this is actually a conversation between the two musicians, Brahms and Joachim. And then when the violinist enters, it's definitely with a bang, very powerful opening. And there's always a question of what to do with the bowing here. So obviously you have to start down bow. But then if you do it as it comes, it doesn't quite feel good. Maybe there's somebody out there who does it as it comes. I haven't ever seen it. So you can hook the second 16th in. But I feel like by the time you've done a powerful down bow with both of your stick, you're trying to do this little note with, at the weak tip of your bow. And also, you even have to kind of stop the first note in order to grab the next note. Now, that's how most people do it, and it's certainly fine. Um, but thankfully, and I'm trying to think who told me this idea. I wish I could remember so I could give them proper credit, because if I recall correctly, it wasn't my own original idea. But in any case, somewhere along the line, I discovered that you could do a down and then another down bow and actually not have to stop the bow and make two staccatos to do those two notes and yet not make a slur either. What you can do is you can do an angular string cross, keeping your bow on the, on the lower side of the G and then clunking over to your D. Most of the time in violin playing, we try to minimize our string crosses during a slur um, or we try to articulate a hook um, with the articulation of the bow. But in this case, I'm using a bad string cross, a clunky string cross to make my articulation and it works super well. <laughs> All the notes have power, and the first note can do everything it wants to, and then go into an up bow, and then the hooked notes are lower in the bow than they would be if I was hooking in the first sixteenth. Way up there. See, now I'm more in the middle of the bow. So I just. Well, at the end of this intro, there is a trill, a cadential trill. So there's your dominant seven. the little Nachschlag, and then there you are with a melody. 
So when it comes to trills, a lot of people have a default setting. Whatever their trill is, that's what they do when it says trill. And um, then you get funny cases like a Zimbalist who had this machine gun trill, just brrrr. I mean, it was so fast, it was amazing. But he would, whatever it said to trill, he would use that trill. And when you hear his Mozart concerto, it's, it doesn't even feel, it's like super impressive, but it doesn't feel appropriate for the character of the music to suddenly have this like super fast trill. It's like too intense for what's going on, um, you know in the character of, of whatever section he's playing. So we would never do that with vibrato, right? We would never have just one speed and width that whenever we want to vibrate, we use just that one single kind of vibrato. I mean, when we're students, of course, having any vibrato at all is the first step, but then we start to create variety in our vibrato and it's a, it's a journey that we never stop um, trying to refine and refine and find all the different gradations of vibrato to have all the different colors in our playing. But yet when it comes to trills, very often people just trill. And so just like your vibrato might start slow and then open up, right? Or, or the opposite when you're relaxing or diminuendoing. So why not do the same thing with a trill? Start this one a little slower, speed up, and slow it down at the end. It gives that measures so much shape. And it's something we, we do need to think a lot more about um, as, as players. And, um, so the orchestra is doing these wonderful, dramatic broken octaves. Da, bum, 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 bum. And the violinist is... And then they're still doing the broken octaves. So as always, when there are concertos where the main musical material is not the soloist, it's important for the soloist to think, well, is what I'm doing somehow in opposition to that, or should I be actually matching that um, particular mood that the real material is setting? And in this case, I think definitely the latter. There's, there's this, this kind of imperiousness about those, um, those broken octaves, and so your part shouldn't be about flash and you know, virtuoso showing off. It should really just be um, an augmentation of the mood that those broken octaves are creating. And actually there's a further argument for um, not playing it in a flashy way, which is Joachim's personality and musical um, opinions. It's often very instructive, very illuminating to study the life and personality of the dedicatee of a work when a composer wrote a piece for someone else, because often the composer was not just drawing upon their own musical personality, but they were somehow incorporating elements of the dedicatee into their work, and you can't fully understand the work unless you also know something about the other half of the collaborative duo. And so Joachim was an amazing guy. I mean, I revere him so much. Um, I often think, you know, WWJD, what would Joachim do? <laughs> and so, and he, he was like, just had such insight into great music. So it was Joachim who realized, you know, 40 years after it had been written and rejected by everyone, he realized that the Beethoven concerto was actually a great piece of music and played it so profoundly that he convinced others that it was. Um, he was the first one that realized that the late string quartets of Beethoven were not just experiments but actually could be truly enjoyed by audiences and his quartet played them so convincingly that audiences did indeed enjoy them. Um, it was Joachim who said that the Bach solo sonatas and partitas were not compositional exercises or mirror etudes but could actually be performed as concert repertoire. I mean the guy was amazing. He was not infallible and he was also deeply conservative. Um, and so for example he criticized, you know we think of this this um, movement of one of the Bach um, orchestral suites as air on a G string, even though obviously the real version nothing to do with the G string, but Wilhelmi, Augusta Wilhelmi, a Joachim contemporary big soloist, he did this thing.
played the whole entire piece just on the G string. And of course, people fell in love with it because of it. You know, we, we call that movement air on a G string, thanks to Wilhelmi. But Joachim was totally scandalized and offended. And he's like, how could Wilhelmi do that? He's, he's taking the, the great music of Bach and turning it into Paganini circus tricks. And yeah, so that's how Joachim was, very conservative. And so therefore, if you play this section like you might be tempted to do in a Vinyovsky sort of way. You know, then you'd be really going against Joachim and by extension Brahms because he was so heavily influenced by Joachim's taste um, overall, not just in violin writing and, and this concerto and other works, but like as a general rule, um, Brahms was definitely following Joachim's lead. Um, and so, you know, it should... Um, just have musical line and seriousness of purpose. Brahms is known for these little hairpins, this kind of crescendo diminuendo, but on a single note. And it's really like a written out swell. A lot of times, you know, we players will swell when we shouldn't. And, um, you know, it's always a challenge to police yourself and make sure you're not letting too many of your notes have bellies that they shouldn't. But Brahms wants this very kind of deliberate, slightly exaggerated one. And I love this little tiny passage because he has a big swell and then a note without one where you're still expressive but shouldn't let yourself swell and then this one where he starts soft and then opens up so i love that he has three long notes in a row each of which has a totally different shape and it's said see that he said he um, started incorporating that lick into his guitar solos on the electric guitar and nobody before had had done that and then Eddie Van Halen started copying him and of course everybody started copying Eddie Van Halen now you'll hear those things in every you know stereotypical electric guitar solo and, and Uli was like that's literally from the Brahms violin concerto so, I so what's printed is uh, for the two sixteenths is a slur with a dot on the second 16th. Um, now, if you didn't know anything about Brahms or this time period or anything else, if you just saw the notes on the page, you might be inclined to slur them and then have a little lift, a little breath, um, right after the second 16th, right? A slur with a stop because there's a dot on that note, doesn't necessarily make you stop before it because it is slurred to the previous note. Brahms and Joachim apparently had a big argument about this, and I know this because um, at, in the early 90s, I had the great honor to um, have some lessons with Werner Schultz from the Hans Eisler Hochschule. Um, the, the wall had recently come down and he had been in East Berlin his whole life, but now um, you know, we could access um, that, that um, school and those professors. And so every time I would be going back and forth to Europe um, throughout the early 90s, I would either go early or stay late and have lessons with Professor Schultz. And it was just absolutely wonderful. Professor Schultz was a student of Gustav Havemann, who was a student of Joachim. So in my lessons, Professor Schultz would say, well, my teacher said that Joachim said that Brahms said to play it like this. <laughs> I was like, okay, yes, sir, Herr Professor. <laughs> but in this case, he, was, he said that his teacher, Havemann, told him about this argument with Brahms and Joachim, that Joachim was insisting that if Brahms wanted future violinists to know exactly what his intentions were, his intentions were not two equal notes, which is why he wouldn't have put dots on both notes. He wanted a slight lean and a little bit longer bow stroke on the first one, and then a little bit l lighter, shorter note for the second one. So Joachim said um, what you would expect any violinist to propose, which is, well, why not put a dot plus dash on the first one, and then a dot on the second one? And Brahms didn't like that idea. Um, Joachim finally said, what about a dash plus dot, which is less ideal, but at least tells you something. Brahms didn't like that either. He, Brahms insisted finally on this slur plus one dot idea. And Joachim said, people are going to be confused. And indeed, these days you do see people being confused about that. So what Brahms, what my teacher said that his teacher said that Joachim said is that Brahms wanted this slight separation.
my CD booklet, I was trying to articulate this, and um, I finally came up with, if the Beethoven concerto captures the beauty of God's creation, the Brahms concerto conveys its magnitude and power. And so, yeah, it does feel like something about the majesty of creation, something larger than ourselves is being expressed by this concerto. It's like taking it beyond the human level. This is the manuscript of Montal's cadenza, which was never published, and clearly she wrote it down for herself. She was, of course, a Joachim student. Um, lots of parallels in, her, in our lives that she studied with Joachim, and I studied with a student of a student of Joachim, and we were both born in Illinois. Anyway, um, so I had this manuscript, and I was preparing all of her own arrangements, all the works dedicated to her. Um, for and um, for preparing it for publication, in some cases the manuscript had been lost and we were transcribing it carefully from her recording. In other cases, things hadn't been published and so we had to enter it into the computer and make editorial decisions. It was a seven-year project, quite intense, and also in terms of um, writing the program notes, which um, my counterpart, um, Karen Schaefer, Mon Powell's biographer, did all of that work, which was a huge amount of work. So for the cadenza, I had to make certain decisions about, well, if there are no slurs, was that just because she knew she was going to slur and didn't need to bother to write it down because obviously it was, a, you know, this was like kind of just shorthand for herself to remember her cadenza, but not what she would have handed someone and to say, do this. And the biggest decision that had to be made is what to do about the first measure because her cadenza actually starts, and I don't know, Maybe you could make that effective, but I feel like every single other cadenza that's ever been written starts with some kind of dun, da, 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 da. And so, um, again, maybe she just didn't write that first bar down because she was gonna play Joachim's first bar, and so then she just started writing down where she deviated from Joachim's cadenza. So I actually did add the first bar of Joachim's cadenza to Maud Powell's cadenza to give it um, what I think is an appropriate first bar. But so Brahms found an aristocratic family to buy an instrument for Marie Soldat's use, and he chose this one. So this very violin, um, it's known as the ex Bazzini ex Soldat, because before Marie Soldat it was played by Antonio Bazzini. Someday it might be known as the ex Pine, but I won't ever be around to find out. So, um, But it's known as the ex Bazzini ex Soldat, and um, not only did Brahms choose it for Marie Soldat, but considering that they played chamber music together and she was playing on this violin, it means that this very violin got to jam with Brahms. It's just because in the early 90s when I was doing all of my um, international competitions in Europe, there was still a stigma among the older generation of professors, you know, most of whom have um, since passed away. There was the stigma that Brahms was a man's concerto. And girls could play Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, whatever, but Brahms was a man's concerto. And yet it was the one that I felt most comfortable with. And so, you know, a few years later when I started really learning about Maud Powell and Marie Soldat, it felt like, wait a sec, hey, obviously Brahms didn't think that his concerto was a man's concerto because he was delighted by the um, wonderful interpretations of these two female Joachim students who were getting it out there into the world. Okay, a couple anecdotes I was gonna tell you, but I will wait for the Zoom. The nice thing about the Zoom is I can tell you all the anecdotes that couldn't squeeze into this concert. But I will... um, after that gorgeous oboe solo, I feel like the bar is set so high to have this purity of sound, just a perfect, perfect invisible string crosses and bow changes. And so that's like the spot I obsess over because I don't want people to have heard this gorgeous, gorgeous oboe tone and then hear me and go, ah, oh, a pale imitation of how that melody sounded so beautiful a moment ago. So I always try to make sure that my tone is as gorgeous as it possibly could be in that very opening of the second movement. Well, I gave my album to um, one of the guitarists from my metal band and after he listened to it, he was like, Hey, you were playing the There Will Be Blood song. But it's marked Allegro Giocoso Manon Tropo Vivace. So fast, but not too fast. This is typical Brahms prevarication. He's always like, kind of, sort of this, but not too much of that. Like, you know, he can't just ever write Allegro. Even his first movement is marked Allegro Non Tropo. There's this spot where there's dotted rhythms, and half of them have rests. <laughs> eighths um, with no rests. 
So to have a real difference between the ones that are dum, bum, 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 and then dum, bum, 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 really sustained. And it's great when the orchestra does that. I have it first. And then as you can see, the orchestra does it next. This forth, and it has a feeling of being held back because a lot of it is piano, but a, an intense piano that wants to be loud. Full of, of held back energy. And then it gets loud, and then it gets soft again, and then it gets loud. from Andrew. Hi, this is Andrew from Ohio. Rachel, I have a couple of nerdy violin questions for you. Is there any evidence that Marie Soldat wrote her own cadenza for the Brahms? I mean, it does make sense that she would have played her teachers, Joachim's, but did she leave any of her thoughts about how a cadenza should go behind? And also the recording she made in 1920, is that on your fiddle? Okay, well, Great questions, and <laughs> I guess I'm a geek too because I was just thinking about Marie Soldat and her lack of a cadenza um, just a couple days ago as I was prepping for this concert. 
but I have not read anything about her having written her own cadenza. And actually, this does ring true, because whereas Maud Powell, now she didn't compose original music, um, but she did a lot of transcribing, a lot of her own arrangements. Um, and Marie Soldat, um, to my knowledge, um, again, maybe I'm missing something, but to my knowledge, um, there aren't, you know, like little concert pieces, encores, different transcriptions that she's done. So, so she just probably wasn't as much of the composing type. Thanks to all of you for listening and um, hope to see some of you on the Zoom in just a few minutes. And meanwhile, um, please do send in questions for the, the next episodes. We've got tons of different concertos yet to come. Um, we've got, let me do my math, 17 still more to go. Um, and so you can always submit questions about more than one concerto. And any concerto for which you send in a question, you get a free ticket. You can send it in written, audio, video, whatever format suits your personality and your technology. Um, the instructions are right there on the Our Concerts page. So I look forward to getting your questions and I look forward to playing lots more concertos for you. Next week is Concerto in A Major by Joseph Bologna, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. See you there.